The Sutta Nipata, an ancient collection of the Buddha's discourses, together with its commentaries, translated from the Pali by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Preface. This volume offers a new translation of the Sutta Nipata together with its commentarial apparatus. The Sutta Nipata is an anthology of discourses ascribed to the Buddha included in the Kuddhaka Nikaya, the minor or miscellaneous collection, the fifth of the five Nikayas that constitute the Sutta Pitaka of the Pali Canon. The Sutta Nipata sits in this collection alongside such popular works as the Dhammapada, the Udana, and the Ithiuttaka, and is itself a perennial favorite among followers of Theravada Buddhism. Most of the discourses in the Sutta Nipata are in verse, some in mixed prose and verse. None is entirely in prose. Several discourses in the Sutta Nipata are found in the main collections, specifically in the Majjhima, Samyukta, and Anguttara Nikayas, though most are unique to this anthology. Linguistic and doctrinal evidence suggests that the Sutta Nipata took shape through a gradual process of accretion spread out over three or four centuries. The anthology is unique to the Pali Canon though it contains discourses with parallels in other transmission lines among the schools of early Buddhism. This implies that the Sutta Nipata itself was compiled within the Pali school from pre-existing material. Several of its texts are considered to be among the most ancient specimens of Buddhist literature. Among these are two chapters, the Attaka Vagga and the Parayana Vagga, that are quoted in the Samyukta and Anguttara Nikayas. These two chapters are moreover the subjects of a two-part expository text, the Niddesa, so old that it was included in the Kuddhaka Nikaya. The Sutta Nipata also contains discourses that have been absorbed into the common Theravada monastic liturgy. Among them, the Metta Sutta and the Ratana Sutta, and popular discourses like the Parabhava Sutta and the Mahamangala Sutta, that serves as the basis of Buddhist lay ethics. These suttas are often drawn upon by preachers of the Dhamma for their sermons to the laity. The Sutta Nipata has been previously translated into English at least six times by Robert Chalmers, Vigo Fosbo, E.M. Eyre, Venerable H. Sadhatisa, K.R. Norman and N.A. Jayavikrama. A German translation by Jnanaponika Thera is also available. A translation of the Attakavagga by Bhikkhu Panyabhaso has been published in a small printed edition inclusive of the Pali text. Several chapters and individual suttas are posted on the website Access to Insight, most translated by Thanissaro Bhikkhu. Another translation of the Attakavagga, this one by Jill Fransdahl, was published too late for me to consult when preparing the present work. My intention in preparing this work was not to offer still another translation that would improve on the work of my predecessors and shake up the world of Buddhist scholarship with bold, innovative renderings. Rather, 
It was to make the Sutta Nipata available in an accurate and readable version along with its commentaries as preserved in the Pali Buddhist tradition. This is, I believe, the first time that the entire Sutta Nipata commentary and substantial excerpts from the Nidesa have been published in translation. I based my translation of the Sutta Nipata on three editions. I relied primarily on the excellent Roman script edition by Dines Anderson and Helmer Smith, published by the Pali Text Society. But I also consulted two other versions. One is the electronic edition of the Burmese Chatta Sangayana Tipitaka, the Sixth Council Compilation, published by the Vipassana Research Institute and available online. The other is the Singhala script Buddha Jayanti edition published in Sri Lanka, now available online as a PDF. Occasionally, I preferred a reading in one or another, or both, of these editions to that in the Pali Text Society edition. When I do so, I have usually mentioned my preference in a note. My numbering scheme follows that of the Pali Text Society edition. In preparing my translation of the Sutta Nipata, I regularly consulted the careful and precise translations by Norman and Jayavikrama and often referred to them in my notes. I also found Norman's end notes particularly helpful in understanding the text from a philosophical perspective. Jayavikrama's monograph, a critical analysis of the Sutta Nipata, gave me insight into the work's historical and linguistic development. The two translations I consulted most often occasionally differ due to their divergent approaches. Norman's aim, as he expresses it in his preface, is to give the meaning of the text as it was intended to be understood by the original speaker or as it was accepted by the first hearers. This is a tall order for one living so far from the culture and the environment in which the Sutta Nipata took shape. But Norman brought to the task his consummate knowledge of Middle Indo-Aryan languages. Jai Vikrama, in contrast, leans heavily on the commentary and thus follows more closely traditional Theravadin exegesis. In my translation, I have tried to steer a middle course between the two. I sought to remain faithful to the words of the text when it is clear, simple and straightforward. Since this is not always the case, I relied on the commentary to understand more difficult verses and obscure words and expressions. There were, however, places where I had to differ from the commentary, even when doing so created a dissonance between my rendering of the root text and the commentary. I have noted these discrepancies in the introduction, where I refer to the notes that explain my disagreement. Also, unlike Norman and Jayavikrama, I have composed my translation in free verse. Since I am not a poet, I did not aim at poetic elegance, but simply at rendering the verses in a style that is more uplifting and less pedantic than a bare prose translation. To keep the translation of the canonical text as trim as possible, I have relegated virtually all my notes dealing with matters of substance to the commentary section with verse 
and commensal numbers correlated. The citation of lines in these notes refer to the Pali text, not the translation. Thus, for example, 189C means verse 189, third line of the Pali. Because of the differences in syntax between the two languages, the line number of a Pali verse is not always the same as that of the English rendering. The notes to the root text deal primarily with my choices among the readings in the three editions I consulted and with other minor linguistic matters. Occasionally, too, I cite the commentary in a note to clarify a reading. I have recorded parallels to the discourses in the Sutta Nipata in two places under the summary of each sutta, in guide to the sutta, and in appendix 1. I also referred to parallels when I discussed them in the notes to the commentary section. The commentary on the Sutta Nipata is named Paramatta Jyotika, since the commentary on the Kuddaka Pata, a short work in the Kuddaka Nikaya, is also named Paramatta Jyotika. Modern editors designate the Kuddaka Path commentary Paramatta Jyotika 1 and the Sutta Nipata commentary Paramatta Jyotika 2. Paramatta means supreme meaning and Jyotika illuminator or elucidator. Thus, I render the title elucidator of the supreme meaning. This commentary is traditionally ascribed to Acharya Buddha Gosha, the Indian monk who came to Sri Lanka in the 5th century CE, where he composed the Vishuddhimagga, Path of Purification, a comprehensive treatise of Buddhist doctrine and meditation, and commentaries on the four main Nikayas. He may also have been the author of still other commentaries as well. The commentaries, known as Attakatha, were based largely on older commentaries preserved in the ancient Singhala language, which in turn, it is said, were translated from still old Indian originals brought to the island centuries earlier. Buddha Gosha's Authorship of the commentary to the Sutta Nipata is disputed and it is virtually impossible to settle the issue with certainty. What is clear, however, is that the author of the Sutta Nipata commentary, whoever it may have been, draws upon the same system of exegesis that Buddha Gosha used, the system that had evolved over the centuries at the Mahavihara, the great monastery in Anuradhapura, the ancient capital of Sri Lanka. Paramatta Jyotika too thus belongs to the same body of Attakatha considered authoritative by the Theravada school of Buddhism. These commentaries look at the canonical text through the lens of exegetical analysis maintained by the elders of the Mahavihara, which often draws upon ideas and schemes of categories unique to the Pali school. I have translated the entire commentary with a few minor omissions. I omitted portions of the term explanations, Padavannana, that merely define particular Pali words in the canonical text by way of synonyms more familiar to readers in the age of the commentaries. To have translated these passages intelligible English, I would have had to define common English words with other common English words, which would be redundant if my translation of the root text is sufficiently clear. 
I have omitted two translations of individual sentences here and there that deal with technical grammatical issues and other matters of protocol. My translation of commentary is based primarily on the Pali Text Society edition of Paramatta Jyotika 2, edited by Helmer Smith. I also consulted the Vipassana Research Institute's electronic version of the Chatta Sangana edition and the Sinhala script Simon Heva Vitarana Bequest edition. Smith omitted from his edition of Paramatha Jyotika 2 the commentaries on three suttas that the Sutta Nipata shares with the Kuddhakapata, the Metta, Ratana, and Mahamangala suttas. He had already edited Paramatha Jyotika 1, and since the explanations of these discourses are almost identical in the two commentaries, he decided to avoid the repetition. I, therefore, translated the commentaries on these suttas from Pali Text Society edition of Paramatta Jyotika 1. Again, while also consulting the Burmese and Sri Lankan edition of Paramatta Jyotika 2, which include them. While the style of the Atthakatha can be dense and ponderous, I believe it is important to have the commentaries on the canonical text available in English translation as a safeguard against arbitrary interpretations. Since the Sutta Nipata is composed mostly in verse and the stanzas are sometimes obscure and suggestive, it is tempting for writers on early Buddhism to seize upon single suttas and even a few enigmatic stanzas as the building blocks for erecting their own personal theories about original Buddhism, just as the Buddha intended it. Thus, based mainly on the Sutta Nipata, claims are sometimes put forth that Buddhism was originally a pre-monastic movement made up of individualistic wandering hermits, or that the Buddha was a radical skeptic whose teaching had no room for such ideas as karma, rebirth, samsara, and transcendent liberation, but was aimed solely at inner tranquility through the relinquishment of all views and attachments. Such theories depend largely on selective citation in defiance of the weight of evidence bearing down from the great mass of early Buddhist literature and stubborn facts about the history of Buddhism. Reading the Sutta Nipata in the light of the main Nikayas and their commentaries should serve to correct such speculative theories. While the commentaries certainly represent the views of later generations of exegetes and may not compute the original intent of the work in all respects, to ignore or reject them is to dismiss the cumulative effort of the early doctrinal masters to understand and explain the word of the Buddha. As mentioned above, Two chapters of the Sutta Nipata, the Attakavagga and the Parayanavagga, along with Kagavisana Sutta, taken as su the subject of an expository work included in the Kuddhaka Nikaya. This work, known as the Nidesa or Exposition, is divided into two parts. The larger part, the Mahanidesa, or Great Exposition, commence on the Attakavagga. The Chola Nidesa, or Minor Exposition, commence on the Parayanavagga and the Kagavisana Sutta. By necessity, I have included 
only excerpts from the Nidesa. Given that the Maha Nidesa comes to 385 pages in the Chattasangayana edition and the Chola Nidesa to 275 pages, full translations of these texts would have swelled this volume far beyond serviceable size. I have selected what I consider the most illuminating passages of both parts of the Nidesa and interlaced them with the translation of Paramatta Jyotika too. I have sometimes simplified my rendering of the Nidesa and have tried to avoid excessive repetition, which is hard to do with a work as repetitive as the Nidesa. Only occasionally did I include translations of the suttas from other sources that the Nidesa quotes to reinforce its explanations. William Steed, in editing the Pali Text Society edition of the Chola Nidesa, reorganized the work in accordance with his own concept of it as an aggregate of disconnected pieces or atoms. He arranges in Pali alphabetical order the terms commented on by the Chola Nidesa and for each term provides the verse numbers where the terms occur and the relevant explanations. For this reason, his edition was not suitable for my purpose, which requires that I follow the sequence of the verses. I have therefore used as my text the Vipassana Research Institute's electronic version of both parts of the Nidesa, the Maha and the Chula portions, included in their edition of Bali Tipitaka. The source for each excerpt is set in bold preceding the passage. Those who read Pali can find the passage in the electronic version by comparing the numbers with the Vipassana Research Institute's page numbers at the bottom edge of the window. The serious non-academic student of early Buddhism might feel daunted by the amount of material presented in this volume and not know where or how to proceed. As a practical approach, I suggest initially reading the introduction and the guide to the suttas and then the translations of the Sutta Nipata itself. Read it slowly and reflectively without being anxious to understand every verse and line on a first reading. After reading and digesting the root text to the best of one's ability, return to the text again, this time reading each sutta individually or perhaps even each verse along with the commentary on it. Skip over those parts of the commentary one finds dense, tedious, pedantic and irrelevant to one's concerns and focus on those parts that actually explains the text. Connections between the root text and the corresponding portion of the commentary are easy to make because both use the same numbering scheme. Thus, for instance, the commentary explanations of stanza 18 can be located by finding the bold number 18 in the commentary section. Lines and phrases from the root text being commented on known as the lemma as set in bold. This makes them easy to identify occasionally when there are gaps in the numbering of the commentary section this is either because the commentary does not comment on the verse or because it merely offers routine word glosses that I thought need not be translated. By any merit I have acquired through this work, may the three gems of the Ratana Sutta 
long flourish in the world and may the people of the world live together in peace guided by the ethics of the Parabhava Sutta. The values of the Mahamangala Sutta and the sublime attitudes of the Metta Sutta. May seekers of liberation discard erroneous views and deviant practices as advised by the Atakatavagga and set their feet on the path to the goal pointed to by the Parayanavagga. The chapter on the way to the beyond. Acknowledgements Bhikkhu Analeo and John Kelly read the entire translation of the Sutta Nipata alongside the Pali text as well as the translation of the commentary and both made helpful recommendations. Venerable Analeo also suggested additions to my concordance of parallels. Bhikkhu Kemaratana read the translation of the Sutta Nipata and made several suggestions regarding my terminology, drawing me back to the use of simple, ordinary words rather than more elevated literary words. At several points, when questions arose in my mind about terms and passages in the commentary, I posted them on the Yahoo Pali discussion group and received quick replies from group members. I found particularly helpful the replies from Peter Kiefer Paul, Brian Levman, and the late Lance Cousins. I am thankful to the residents and the staff of Chang Yang Monastery who allowed me the leisure to undertake this translation with minimal disturbances. I am also grateful to my lay students for their support. As with their earlier volumes in the teachings of the Buddha series, Wisdom Publications has done an excellent job of production. I am thankful to the editor, David Kettlestorm, for his editorial suggestions to Megan Anderson for meticulous proofing to the production team and to the publisher Timothy McNeil Bikubodi Chaoyang Monastery Carmel New York